You fail, that creates experience. Experience creates confidence. Confidence creates credibility. You become good by failing. You don't fail more, you just fail. So let's see how much I can fail. Being able to work through Blue Fishing, uh, the book that you've written, which is like part memoir, part business strategy. The thought that I had though, is when I picked up the book, this mindset stuff from the guy who grew up as a bricklayer, you know, tough family, flying the world, doing all this really cool stuff. Did you know that you were writing a mindset book when you wrote that, when you sat down to write it? No, uh, the whole, the whole, I was literally in a, in a bar uh, it, it's been known to happen. Uh, I was in this <laughs> bar up in New York and uh, there was this private party going on. And I'm with my wife, thankfully, which will make sense when I continue. And I was talking to this young girl and um, she brought up something and I started telling her about a story of how I was involved with her and I did this and I did this. And she literally put her drink down and ran away from me at such speed and focus and determination that the guy behind her kind of like turned around because this young girl had run away from me. Now get the picture for anyone that can't see me. This is a young girl. I'm 245 pound of ugly and I'm stood there and this guy's looking at me going, what have you done, mate? You know, what? Now, if my wife hadn't been with me, that could have gone even worse. But I looked at her and I was like, what? Did, did I, did I say something? Cause she, bolted off. She came back dragging this woman that was more my age and she went, tell her the story. Start again. Tell her the story. So I was like, oh, okay. And so I told her the story and then it turns out that she was one of the top editors of Simon & Schuster. So a week later, they approached me and they went, we want you to write a book naming all the, the, the powerful people that you do these amazing experiences for. And I said, no. If I did that, I'd be dead by cocktail hour. So I can't. And then I went and did a speech for a guy called Joe Polish at Genius Network. Mm -hmm. Someone saw it, passed it back to her. So it's amazing how your connections kind of like spider web into each other. And she came back to me and she went, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's change the book offer. Rather than talk about the people you did the business for, talk about how a guy that got kicked out of school at 15 as a bricklayer suddenly ended up working with Sorrell and John on the, on the Vatican. <laughs> and so they offered me a lovely big chunk of change. And I thought to myself, I haven't got to sell the book. Right. I'm getting paid now to write the book. I don't care if it sells. So I can write the book I want to sell. I can write the book that I want people to read. I can say in my book what I want people to do uh, and not have to dilute it for the book sales, for the numbers, for the, for the, I didn't give a shit. I don't want to have been paid. So um, I ended up writing the book with a, with a, a, a ghost writer that they actually ended up calling the translator. Um, but um, I ended up going through it and it was funny because I didn't know what I was writing. I'd never written a book before and I'm working with this girl, Megan, and she would be like, okay, so how did you get uh, the, the museum to shut down in Florence or the people down to see the Titanic? And I'd be like, well, it's easy. I did this and this. And then I did this. And she was like, don't care about that. What's those first two steps you did? <laughs> and I went, well, you, you just do this and this. But then I did that. And she said, no, you're missing the point. Everyone knows the big stuff you do. Yeah. But it's those little steps that kind of like creep up that people don't pay attention. So she was revealing to me how I did those little things. She went, you know, people don't do this. Yeah. You know, yeah, you and that's, and that's what's so interesting. So, I mean, yeah. anyone who's looked into you, they can get the highlight reel, right? You know, that, that you worked with Ferrari and you host, you know, Sir Elton John's Academy Award party each year. And you've worked, you know, you've, you've worked in Asia and in Europe and in all the cool places and you help high rollers, you know, uh, have dinner in front of the statue of David. Um, you know, just like some of the, you know, the, the, the story of the, of the, of the, um, the, uh, TV personality who's playing four songs in journey, like, like really cool shit that you're putting together. And that's probably not even half of it. Not even in 28 years, 29 years, 30 years, however long it is now, it's probably not even a fraction of it. 
But what's so interesting to me is the story you just shared of I'm at the bar and this woman runs away and comes back and it happens to be the editor of Simon and Schuster or whatever. And then I don't want to write their books. So I tell them to go fuck themselves uh, politely. And then you're doing this other thing with Genius Network and it gets spread back. And somehow now you get to do the thing you want. That seems like that seems like the story of your life, man, like like pushing people away. Um, being true to who you are now, and I know it wasn't always this way, um, being true to who you are, and the universe just somehow, everything kind of works out. I mean, is that Let's is that break what's it happened? down. Um, by design, yes. And I say by design. I'm not a great fan of karma and accident uh, or coincidence. Mm -hmm. I, I literally say I move, I move by direction. Um, I noticed years and years and years ago when I was in East London riding around on a motorcycle that would start when it wanted to. <laughs> and I would go into a bar and we would literally all order a beer. Then we'll all order another beer. There was none of kind of like, I'll get the next round because we didn't have that kind of money. You'd buy your own bloody beer. Um, you'd buy your second beer. And then what would happen was you'd all pull in the middle of the table all the change you've got left to see if you can get another two or three beers and then you'll eke it out between everyone else's pint glass. That was my normal day. And I realized one day as we were doing that, that I don't even have enough money for my third beer. Mm. And I looked around the rest of, the, of the, the bar and they were all the same. And I love motorcycles, but there was no nice motorcycles in our group. And I suddenly realized Everyone at all of these tables, Jimmy up on the stall, Roger on the other table, Billy playing darts, you all broke ass bikers. And then I realized I was a part of that room. You're a broke ass biker. <laughs> I was that person. And so what I did was I thought to myself, I don't need to change my job. I don't need to change any of those things because those things are a byproduct of you changing your mindset. Now, I didn't realize it at the time. But I just thought to myself, I've got to change the room I'm in. If I want to be more, I've got to be in a room where people are more, think more, do more. So the first thing I did, which was wrong, uh, and that's how we get experienced, was I started hanging out in these new things called wine bars, these little yuppie bars in East London. Now, bear in mind, I could afford two and a half beers in my old pub I could only afford one beer now, which was like this imported thing from, from Mexico. And, you know, everyone was like, whoa, all hail the imported beer. And so I'm like, you know, nursing one beer for three hours, trying to watch how people communicate. Now, of course, in those areas, there was a lot of flaky and fake people. So I got to notice uh, uh, pretentious people really quickly. And I got really good at filtering through the bullshitters. And I really, I realized very early on, the people I was trying to kind of hang around with weren't in the wine bar. It was the people that were pretending to be the successful people that were in it. But that was an education. I had to change the room I was in. So I kept on doing that. And here's the daft thing. We all look at the bar story that I gave you and could go, well, that was luck. He was at the right place. He was having the right conversation. But when you change your room to only be full of dynamic, creative disruptors, then creative disrupting happens. So don't leave it for chance. Be in control of the room you're in. That is so good. And so you, you, grew, up, you grew up in a construction family. I did, I did too. I mean, uh, now I was lucky my family were developers. But when I was young, when I was 14, my grandfather gave me a job. And he wanted to give me the hardest job he could find so I could really learn the value of hard work. And I, want, I was thinking about this as I was working through your book, because your family was bricklayers. Um, at one point, I wasn't happy with how much money I was making. And I turned to my, to, to my foreman. We were doing ground maintenance, you know, property maintenance, all this stuff. I said, I think I want to make more money. I'm thinking like roofing, bricklaying or something. I have a few opportunities. And he's like, do not become a bricklayer. Do not become a junior bricklayer. All you're going to do all day long is just carry bricks up and down and up and down and up and down. He's like, you do not want that job. <laughs> That's where you started. <laughs> like in the job that 
My construction failure was like, do not go into that. It's too hard. It's too tough. It's <laughs> the worst of the worst of the worst. So you go from that, you, you know, you go from that, you leave, you leave that, you find yourself in Asia. Now you say like, Hey, I'm, I, I'm in Asia. I'm in Hong Kong and you, you become a doorman and that kind of kicks off a lot of really cool stuff. But what took you to, what took you to Hong Kong? So again, the, the thing about entrepreneurs is we can, we can all be different, okay? But when we hang around with other entrepreneurs, we connect, don't we? We, we? we kind of can suddenly relate to each other. I reckon, and I don't want anyone to do this, but if you've got two entrepreneurs together and you cut them in half, I reckon there's like a purple gene or a blood cell or a speck of DNA that we're all identical because nowhere in the planet can I be in a room having a great conversation with a 16-year-old and a 72-year-old, but as long as they're entrepreneurs, the conversation's flowing because we're all on the same planet. We're all connected. It's when you go to a bar and you start talking to people about what you're going to do and they glaze over and they go, oh, you can, what are you thinking? That's crazy talk. And you suddenly realize you have to, you're dumbing down mm. your expectations of yourself. So as I was growing, I always wanted more and I was aggravated that I wasn't getting it. And it was that aggravation that constantly had me getting in all the wrong jobs. And there was a big thing going on at the time in England where they were recruiting stockbrokers for trainees in Hong Kong. Now, I knew nothing about money. You know, my mum used to manage my checkbook. You know, I knew absolutely, absolutely nothing about Basically, I was, and as a brick, I was cash only. So I didn't know anything about money at all. So I went in there to, to just take a chance. You know, if they're going to train people, well, maybe I'm trainable, you know? When I got in there and realized that everyone had graduated from somewhere, you know, I, and I was like, oh, shit. you know, I didn't know what graduation was. Um, but what I didn't realize was they were block sending people over there. So I got swept into the net and I got offered the chance in, in Hong Kong. It wasn't until I arrived on the Saturday, got drunk with all the new orientees on a, on a Saturday, because I'm qualified to do that. I got drunk with them again on a Sunday, still qualified. Went on the Monday to orientation, and I was fired on the Tuesday. Hmm. They realized I had somehow got recruited, and they don't know how it happened, and no one did. But I'm suddenly on my ass in Hong Kong, well, what did that feel like? I mean, like, like, I, I know, I know that it seems like for the first half of your career, there was a lot of imposter syndrome, a lot of worry. The second half of your career or, or later life is like no f given way before the, that, that quote was given on the internet, you get fired. You're in Hong Kong. <laughs> I mean, you just brush yourself off. I'd here like, I go. Or did yeah, it just I'd knock like the, to, the wind out of you? I'd like to reframe uh, your statement. I didn't have imposter syndrome until I actually became successful. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I was too stupid to care. And I, I, I mean this. I was so ignorant to the other side of life. Hmm. You know, when I lost my job in Hong Kong, it was a case of, well, what did you expect, Steve? You're a bricklayer, <laughs> you know? This would make for a good story down at the pub. And I remember thinking to myself, I can go back to my pub and everyone will be like, what the hell were you thinking, you idiot? You, what were you chancing? And I would have a good story and I would be the cool person in my pub, but I'd still be back in my pub. Hmm. So I thought, well, I know I got that. I know I can do that. I know I'll be excused and welcomed in. But why don't I try and do something different? Hmm. I'm now in Hong Kong. I've got no family. I've got no friends. I've got no support mechanism, but I've also got no liability and restraint. I've got no handcuffs. And so I thought, I'm free to try. You know, when you fail, you don't fail more, you just fail. So let's see how much I can fail. So I tried to get a job everywhere and it didn't work. And as you've already revealed, one night I'm in a bar um, outside this club on my own, Billy No Mates, drinking this whiskey, trying to work out how I'm going to pay for it. Uh, literally, I was at that state. I was thinking, well, what's going to happen is I'm going to, I was on the patio and I'm thinking I'm going to drink this and then I'm going to run. You know, I, you know I've got nothing anymore. Um, 
when the uh, the girl that run the club actually came up and asked me to help her kick some people out and then offered me a job on the door. And I thought, I don't really want to do, do that. And she said, and I'll pay for your drink. And I thought, well, it saved me running because I'm too big and ugly. I can't run very fast in any case. And I've probably been caught. So it wouldn't have been very pretty. But I became a doorman. And I actually thought to myself, can my life get any worse? You hmm. see, you talk about developers, you talk about the roofers, the bricklayers. These are noble trades. These are skills. And I went from a skilled, revered profession of masonry mm -hmm. to being a guy whose job description was to thump people. And I thought to myself, well, there you go, Steve. You know, you tried for something and you went down here. Can it go any worse? See, th this is... This is the lesson that people think that it is, though, right? I tried for something. It didn't work out. I'm an idiot. I'm a loser. Why did I think I could make it happen? And most people stop there. The richest man on a rainy day is the guy selling umbrellas. And I realized very, very early on that there's opportunities out there. There's angles. Um, and I don't know if this was my street sense, maybe growing up as a Londoner. But you always knew how to kind of like talk the guy down when you were buying your veg on a weekend or getting the shirts off of the market stall, getting a special price for three, you know, for the price of two. You looked for those angles. You were hagglers. You were negotiators. And so when I would be faced with an opportunity that eh, wasn't exactly what I wanted, I'd look for where my angle was. Mm. And I would try to breed the growth in me by analyzing what went wrong. And when I was on the door, I suddenly saw people. Literally, it was as though I'd just had my glasses lifted off and I was suddenly seeing people. I was seeing how precocious people acted to get into nightclubs. I saw how affluent people acted to get in nightclubs. Here's a little thing, and you may remember this when you were younger. Do you remember when you would walk towards the nightclub, okay? And the doorman would be on the door. Now, doorman's job is to look big and intimidating and scary on the front of a door. And the better the club, the scarier the dudes on the door. Okay? And you would walk towards the club, and there would, pe there would be people walking through, past them, into the club, and there'd be a big line on the right-hand side of the club, wouldn't there? Now, before you got towards the club, you would self-select... Are you going to go line up are or you are you just going to walk up and wait for them to say, whoa, hold on? Yeah. And huh. I noticed that they self-selected. And if someone came up to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm here with my wife. I'm looking for a nice table. We'd be like, certainly, Julie, can you look after this? We were good about it, you know? But you'd have these assholes kind of like, tell, yeah, you got to let me in. That never went well. But it was always the people that would self-select. And I discovered that, we're, we're strange. As people, we're strange. We self-select where we fit in. Oh, I can't go and do that. That's for other people. Mm. What other people? What do they look like? Do they have like three ears and no nose? You know, who are these people that apparently get all that shit? And I started noticing that. And do you know, the funny thing was, I've worked in banks. I've worked in jet chart. I've lost all of these jobs. But I've worked in all of these areas which were apparently surrounded by affluent people. But my best education came from working on that door at that shitty nightclub in Hong Kong, Wan Chai, and learning how people valued things, saw things, and how they interacted with each other. And here's mm. one of the things. We're in Hong Kong, which is not a very big island, but there were still people that would come over in fancy cars to show off. And I learned a very early lesson that you would get the people and they would drive up in the car outside the nightclub, okay? Now, bearing in mind, you're going to go in and you're going to drink. You know, you don't want to be driving home. And you're in Hong Kong. It's not very far from anywhere. Um, but they would pull up in that, in that Ferrari or that, that decked-out Mercedes, and they would get out of the car. And I, seeing these people, hell, obviously I saw them. They pulled up there for a reason. I would always ask myself this question. Are they driving the car or is the car driving them? Mm. And I would ask myself that question. And it was fun for me. I'm now learning psychology. And the guy that gets out of the car 
and he gets out almost in slow motion. He opens up the back door and he pulls his jacket out and he throws his back jacket on slowly while making sure everyone in the lineup is checking him out. And then he just nonchalant discards the valet by throwing the keys at him and then like walks in again as though he's walking in slow motion. He needs your attention. He needs that car to validate who he is. Without the car, you wouldn't pay attention to him. The car is the leading character in his play. And then you get another guy that would turn up, get out of the car, talk to the valet guy, not pay attention to anyone. Open up the door so his wife or partner or mate can get out, come up to us and go, hello, mate, can I have a table? You know, he's driven the car. He doesn't need the car to be here. He's got that car for his own reasons. And I used to start asking people this, and this is where the, the cheeky Brit in me would be. I would walk up to people and I'd be going, Hey, I like that Ferrari. You know, why'd you get that car? Oh, I love your watch. Why did you get that watch? Same question for every material object that they had. It's amazing how many people would be like, that car, that's $400,000. I didn't ask how much it cost, mate. I asked why you got it. Mm -hmm. But that answer just told me everything I needed to know, you know? Uh, but then you'll get these other people going, do you know, it's funny you should say that. My dad always used to love those cars. And I remember when I was in a position, I bought it. And I took my dad for joy. I've always loved those cars because it triggers me to think of my dad. Yeah. You know, so I always want That deeper to... story, you know. It is the deepest. It's the why. It's the core. And that was what I always wanted to find in people. Because once I know where that core is, I can play with it. And I ended up building up that concierge firm and... Now the coaching firm, but you've really got to focus on where that core is. Mm. And so, you know, if, if anyone again knows your story, <clears throat> and so again, if anyone knows your story, it's, uh, it's remarkable how you were able to turn this concept, this idea, but, but also, you know, you talk, you talk about how you came up with the name Bluefish. It was because you were being playful and having fun with, you know, Dr. Zeus, Redfish, you know, one fish, two fish, Redfish, Bluefish with passwords. Yeah. Um, but you didn't add a tagline. You, you didn't um, <laughs> have your phone number on the website. I mean, maybe that's a mistake, but, but like all of these things along the way, what I found so, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I'm not, I'm not buttering you up or anything like that. I found you so inspiring how much you could just be you and still succeed, how much you could just follow what seems like your curiosity, your interest, your precocious, like, how about we try it? And you could still succeed. How much you could focus on experience over money and still succeed. Like all of these things that I think of as just like full on ballsy, amazing. I wish I, I not, not even I wish I am taking steps to be as courageous as you've been, but I find it inspiring. I, it wasn't always that way though. Right. There's, there's two things I want to tell you. One of them was, um, a, a person I'm very glad to say is a close friend of mine, Jay Abraham, mm -hmm. um, known each other for years. And he said to me that um, Steve Sims has a greater I can than an IQ. <laughs> um, and I, I always, I always loved that. But I remember way back uh, and I'd moved to California back there and I was, I was just outside of Hollywood and I had a dinner party. And at my dinner party, we had two of the leading actors from the, at the time, new Marvel movies, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, it was when all the superhero movies were coming out. And two of them were, one of them was a, a, a client of mine within the concierge firm. So we had this dinner party and there was only about, I don't know, 12, 18 people at this dinner party. And we're all chatting away. And I'm, I'm actually feeling like a little kid that this is my dinner party and I've got people that are actors, there's rock stars, there's big entrepreneurs, you know, this is my, this is my, wow, Steve, you're, you you got some cool friends. Yeah, I was kind of reveling in my own little kind of like self glory. And the, the guy from the Marvel movie, uh, I won't drop his name. Um, he turned around and he went, well, okay, so you know the movie's coming out and everyone's got superpowers. Let's play the game. What would your superpower be? Now he was opposite me and he started at the far bottom left. And so I knew I had, you know, two thirds of a table before it got to me. So even though it's my party, these are my clients, these are my friends, 
I still wanted to impress them by coming up with a good answer. I actually was like, well, I want to be able to kind of, you know, waggle my finger and, you know, remove famine from countries. Or I want to be able to, you know, with a glance, suddenly make, you know, India fully educated. Uh, well, let's be serious. Every man wants the same superpower to be able to see through clothing. Now, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was not going to go there myself as I was thinking of the question. I was thinking, knows that? okay, yeah, but, I see through clothing. I, yeah, I wanted to think of something that was a little bit more sensible than that, but I couldn't. And I'm really trying to think, you know, what would it be? And there were people that was, you know, people want to be able to, you know, you know, through the, they could puff air and it would, you know, make the clouds go away and the sun, blew. and then there were some good answers coming up. And it gets around to me, and I forget which one I had landed on, but I'd come up with what my answer would be. And the guy looks at me and he's like, Sims, superpower. And so you kind of pretend as though you just, and he goes, oh, I don't know, let me think. Well, <laughs> I suppose, and you do that, okay? My wife was next to me, and she went, hang on, babe, I've got it. I'll do it for you. And there's no one better it's never better than when someone else says something good about you. So my wife has been with me since we were 16 and 17. So I'm like, Same as me. go. For hey, yeah, that? we've been together forever. So I'm like, ah, go on then. What would my superpower be? And I wanted her to say something again, something electric and wonderful and powerful. Um, and she turned around and she said, well, it's easy. Steve's already got this superpower. And I'm thinking, this is good. This is good. You know, the, the ability to make anything happen, the ability to make, Anyone smile, whatever. I was thinking, this would be good because it doesn't come from me. It comes from Claire. She said, Steve's superpower is the power of ignorance. Oh. <laughs> and <sighs> the entire room went quiet. And there were people looking at each other. And I'm now thinking to myself, shit, I'm getting divorced. And, I'm kind of, and she could feel the temperature and tone of the room change. Yeah. And she went, Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Think about it. Yeah. How many times has Steve come back telling you about what he did with Elton John or with the Pope or how he closed down museums or sent people into, into space? And you're sitting there going, How the bloody hell did he pull that off? Yeah, it's like a how it's did a, he how did like a he childlike, do it? Like a yeah. childlike confidence. Exactly. She said, and it's simple. Yeah. He's ignorant to the possibility, plausibility, or option then it can go any other way than he's dreamed and he goes into that room with passion and ignorance to failure that there's only one way it could possibly go and that's for him to get what he asked for hmm. she said he's ignorant to people laughing at him jeering at him ridiculing him or holding him back his superpower is that ignorance hmm. and i was like I, I'm not getting divorced. And everyone you know, gave her a chip. <laughs> and I mean, Bravo, I yeah. love it. <laughs> I never, you see, how old are you? I'm 38. So we're both from an era where we didn't have Instagram to tell us how inadequate our oh. life is. <laughs> no, you know? I, just had, I just had my lack of friends and my, yeah. and my desperate loneliness to remind me. <laughs> I, remember, I remember always getting a Reebok trainers. Okay. okay, with with the pumps, or are you a little bit older than oh, me? Oh no, the pumps were really big no, for me. Yeah, we didn't. No, I wasn't cool enough for pumps. These things had these things called laces. Um, but it was because around the corner from us was this discount store that always, you know, had these old. So I would get some ridiculous colors, but my mum would come back, and there you go. There's, and it was always Reebok. Now my my son, fifteen years old, when he wants a new pair of sneakers, he can quote thirty different bloody brands. Because he follows them or he rappers are wearing them or whatever. He, but the social platforms have given him all of these, this education. I didn't have any of that. So I remember when I was growing up, I needed sneakers. I went to a Reebok store because I didn't know. And then I discovered, wow, there's this place called Adidas and Nike. I didn't know there were three companies that did. That. So it was that lack of education that actually simplified my life and simplified my tone. I needed something to happen. Let's go make it happen. I wasn't listening to the noise of everyone else telling me it couldn't happen. Most of my life, I was ignorant and stupid. Hmm. And that's what I wanted to do. In fact, we, and I can plug it now because I'm, I'm nowhere near finishing it. I'm writing a second book. Are and you? The book is, 
Yeah, the book is called Go for Stupid. Now, I don't go for the impossible because I don't want to go for something that I've already secretly acknowledged can't be done. Yeah. And I remember talking with Elon and Elon turned around and he said, you know, people will always laugh at you before they applaud. So whenever I've done anything, I've always gone, how can I make this ridiculous? How can I make this stupid? How can my next accomplishment be ridiculed until people are in awe and they go, how did he close down that museum? How did he do that with Sir Elton John? How did he do that with Tom Cruise? You know, that's what I want. While it's a concept, it's laughable until it's done. And so I always go for the stupid. Now, later on in my life, but, That's but when, when you the were, but when you were came doing, in and the imposter okay. syndrome. Okay. Okay. Later on the self doubt, when you have something mm. to lose, when you have a name, yes. when you have a reputation, when things yep. get so big and so scary and you're saying yes to the asks and that you got to like, <laughs> you're like, how the fuck do I even pull this off? Uh, I mean, I know you've told the story many, many times, but, but when you told the story of, of, of the Ferrari and the yacht, and the impact oh. of the photo, if you can share it quickly again, I know it's be told it off, but that was the point where it was like, damn, like turning point, man, in your life, mm. right? Yeah, I was, um, I was working for this little car company called Ferrari. Yeah. And um, I happened to be involved in this tiny little minuscule event called Formula One. And it was the 50th anniversary of Ferrari. So basically, it was the perfect storm. And and this, every, is in, this is in Monaco, is it? This where, is in Monaco in 1997. Yeah, so, perfect. So uh, I'm just working with Ferrari at the 50th anniversary at Monaco's Formula One race. Yeah. Uh, I happen, you know, to have a, a vintage collective Ferrari and a rented yacht. Like, you know, one of these normal stories that most people tell. Well, it started off normal. It was supposed to be a big celebratory party. And we got this yacht for this party. Um, and it was at this time, and bearing in mind, Cannes Film Festival being so close to Monaco, we knew that we could get a lot of these actors and, and people over. So we had kings and queens and royalties and celebrities and rock stars. And, you know, my guest list was like a, 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 an Oscar winning, you know, these are the most famous and powerful people in the planet. These are the richest people. Oh, by the way, just for the hell of it, these are royalty. You know, it was... It was that kind of party, and something happened. And here's the daft thing. We'd already booked the yacht. We'd already got all the acceptance for everyone to be there. It was done. All I had to do was freaking show up, and it was in those dark moments. You know, like when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep? Yeah. That's when that, that, that fear came in, and all of a sudden someone piped up and went, hang on a minute, all of your life, and literally all of my life, and even during that period, I have always had two wheels. There's been no country that I haven't had a motorcycle, okay? I now live in Los Angeles. I have 12 motorcycles and no car, okay? Anywhere that we go, we go by Uber or we're riding, okay? But I had thought to myself, hang on a minute, you're going to turn up at this party like I had done the year before on a motorbike in a black T-shirt. Are you mad? Yeah. And I suddenly was like, oh, my God, yeah, I can't. How did I get away with that? You know? And so I went out, and I remember this. Um, I bought My wife had a Range Rover. I bought an Audemars Piguet watch that was the same price as her Range Rover. <laughs> and I went out, and I got tailor-made suits. And I thought, Ar well, Armani, I heard. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going down to this, this yacht. I can't walk up to the yacht. And I went to get a Ferrari, and they went, well, look, sir, these are the Ferraris, but connoisseurs, they buy the vintage Ferrari. So I fell for that shit, and I bought a vintage Ferrari. And I remember turning up at this party, and I was hanging around. There was one time I was at the bar, and this was back in the 80s and 90s, with the, uh, uh, the biggest movie stars was Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Sylvester Stallone, because it was the Rocky, Rambo, and Terminator movies of the time. And I'm at the bar between... Sylvester Stallone and, and uh, Terminator himself. And then I turn around and I get into a conversation with Prince Albert. His father hadn't died, but Prince Albert of Monaco and Hugh Grant and Elizabeth Hurley, because that was the it couple at the time. Right. And then I get off this boat and I suddenly notice that the boat next to me is bigger than the one I had. And I literally got my car and I reversed it up and I got my wife to take a picture 
of me with my yacht and with my car next to the yacht that I didn't even own, but just so that it was a bigger a yacht in the picture. And then carried on with the party and stuff, went back home. And I was living in Switzerland at the time in Geneva. And this was back See, but in even, the Even that sentence right there, I was living in Switzerland in time in Geneva. Even that is a pretty cool thing that you're just throwing out there. Like, I don't even know if you realize how cool some of these things are. Well, well it gets bad. It gets, it gets dirty. This was at a time when, when we took photographs, we would take the roll of film out, yeah. shove it in an envelope, and sometime over the next decade, you'll get your pictures come back to you. And I was in my office, in my apartment in Geneva, and I get my photographs. And I sit down, and I'm all excited because these were celebrities. Me, I had the pictures at my party. And I started going through all of the pictures, Sylvester Stallone and Prince Albert, Sultan of Brunei and royalty from England and kings and queens. And I'm looking through all of these pictures and I noticed something. I wasn't in any of the pictures. Not that I had forgot to have the pictures and the selfies with these people, but it wasn't me. It was this person in a suit wearing a watch that just like the story I told you about the car outside the nightclub had bought those things to impress these people so that they would like them more so yeah. that they would be accepted more. Now I've hung around in bars and just got shit faced with, with famous and powerful people, you know, and then got an Uber. Hunt. I've never cared before and I've never cared since, but I cared then. And I suddenly realized what I had done. I had sold the single biggest asset, that I owned, me. I had sold myself. I had allowed that little nibbling devil on my shoulder of imposter and self-doubt to allow me to go the opposite wrong way and turn up as a fake persona. Mm -hmm. And it was so devastating to me that I started drinking. Um, and I like, I like having a whiskey. You know, there's this reputation of me constantly drinking. You know, that's great for the brand and stuff like that. But I'll maybe have three whiskeys a week. You know, I'm not an every night person. And if I go crazy, maybe I'll have two in one night, you know, and that's it. I'm not a big drinker and I don't want to do that. But I started going through bottle after bottle of bottle and I locked the doors. And I wasn't, I wasn't going for suicide, but I wanted to numb the pain of what I had done. And why was that so costly for you in that moment? I had realized that I had done and then I had started to think and the thinking had got me into trouble by diluting. I had missed out on the 50th anniversary. We joke now that this was the greatest party ever that I didn't go to. And I realized that I had tried to be someone else. I had laughed at these fakes and flakes all of my life. I, I literally call out fake gurus on my Instagram now. I will literally call out people because I couldn't give a shit and I want people to see people for who they are. But for that moment in my life, I was the chump. I was the fake. I was the flake. I was what I openly ridiculed for people to be. And I was the king of it. I was the almighty emperor of fakes at that moment. Hmm. And it was disgusting. Now, luckily, I had some friends that literally kicked the door down of my, uh, my office in my apartment. And um, we sold the watch and car in that same day. And the suits got put in the cupboard, never worn again. And I realized from that moment, I am never showing up as anything other than me. And if you like it, great, I'll stick around. If it alienates you, I'll leave and we'll both be fine. But you are never going to be forced to decide whether or not you like me or not. I am going to be impossible to misunderstand as this is what you get. And if you like it, we'll work together. But no one's ever going to have the privilege of sitting on the fence and being undecided. You know, what's amazing is, um, and maybe why I identify with it so much. I, I, I worked through, even this morning, part of your book you mentioned, um, list the things, the, the, the people, the assets or the, what, what should I say here? Um, list the characteristics of the people you like and the people you don't. And so I just sat down and I was working through it and I listed all of these things on the side, the people I like, you know, they're, um, they do bold things. They take bold action. Um, they do really cool shit. 
Um, they don't seem to care what people think about them. And then on the other side, it's like, I hate people who try to sell me on stuff. Um, don't try to convince me of anything. Um, don't come across as too um, urbane. Like if you're suave and urbane and stuff, it's like, I grew up in kind of the country and it's just like, it seems like shit to me. Um, and I realized on this list, these are not only the people I like and admire, like this is who I want to be. And this is who I don't want to be. And for maybe 10 years now or 12 years or 15 years, I've been playing corporate games and, and, and all of this stuff, you know, to, to make sure that I show up. My kids told me like six months ago, they're like, oh, we can hear you on your phone, dad. We know when you go into fake mode, like fake yeah. mode. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're not yourself, cause you're talking to a client. I'm like, what? Like that Ow. is me. That's my client me. And they're like, oh no, no, that's not really you. And it's like, um, you're lucky that you seem to learn this in one instance, as opposed to waiting, wasting decades, which many of your clients seem to do. So many of us fall into this trap and we, yeah. we waste our whole life. And, and as painful as it may have been for you, I'm impressed that you learned it so quickly. I was lucky. I was very lucky. I remember, I remember when we got into this thing called digital and we started to send out newsletters. Um, I would say, cause I had help writing the book cause I can't write for sh- and I would send out newsletters going, um, you know, last week I got my client to sing with the rock band Journey. Well, what do you want to do next week? And I would just send that out with a picture of him up. It was nothing pretty, nothing laid out. And, you know, I'd get people coming back to me and stuff. And I ended up, um, and it was funny because I, I, I said to you earlier, I got kicked out of school at the age of 15. I ended up lecturing at Harvard twice. <laughs> and one of the lectures that I gave, I ended up picking up the, one of the English lecturer, lecturers as a client. And whenever I would send him an email, he would respond to the email. And at the bottom of the email, because he found it funny, he would mark me for grammar and punctuation. And it would be like three out of ten, must try harder and stuff like that. I hated it. I was getting you know, graded by a, a Harvard lecturer. But... I remember I used to send out these newsletters. And then one day I thought to myself, these are horrible and I don't want to do it. I'm going to get a copywriter. And so I got this copywriter to write my emails, design my emails and send them out. And all I had to do was send my email to him and he would dress it up, make it look pretty and send it out. And I thought, great. I don't have to work on that now. Brilliant. And my business went down. <laughs> my interaction with my clients went down, my connection. Yeah. And so I'm a great believer that if it doesn't, if it's not working, stop it. Don't throw more money at it. Don't try and polish it. You know, you can polish a turd, but it's still a turd. You know, leave it alone. So I canceled my deal with this copywriter, and I went back to, did this last week. Do you want to do the same? Let me know. It's just little things like this. And I sent this email out, and a friend of mine came back, and he responded to the email, and all he said was, glad to see you back. Mm. And I, saw, I suddenly They realized, saw right through it. They saw right through it. They absolutely did. There are certain things that can't be replicated and you should never be one of them. You know, your systems, your, your algorithms, your, your distribution, all of that can be systematized, but you need to show up, not the image you want, but you, and you want to make it so easy for people to be able to relate, connect and identify. You need crystal clear clarity authenticity and I, I i apologize for that is a word that peed me off over the years oh look at him is so authentic when you dare to look at someone and say about or how authentic they are you're acknowledging that everyone else around you is not yeah and the planet is not authentic get rid of authenticity as a new buzzword a medal that you want to get you want to be transparent you want to be impossible to misunderstand. People want to be able to see through you and know exactly why you're, hey, I'm there to sell you a car. Now let's make sure it's the best car for your world, for your life, your family. As long as they're transparent that, about what takes, they're doing, it's it takes great. so much courage though for people. Like, like right over here, this poster I have on the wall, my favorite group, Ben Folds Five, their okay. group. I pulled this off the wall. What's the date? Uh, May 5th, 1999. May 5th, 1999, I went to a concert. Some, we were walking in. We, were the, we lined up. We were the first people in. My friend says, hey, you can rip these posters off the wall. I said, really? I said, but they're up on the wall. He said, no, no, they're, they're there to be taken. I'm like, 
Okay. So the whole night I'm in the concert, sweaty hands, trying to protect this poster. Anyway, we, we end up, we end up getting four of them. We give them out and I, I didn't look, but, but this one has rips and tears all over it because it's got the tape marks. I grabbed, I gave out all the good ones to my friends and I didn't realize they were two sided and I got left with one with rip marks all over it. And that bothered me for years. Like the other side of this poster is French. I don't want a French version. I'm in Canada, right? Like, and so <laughs> it drove me crazy until finally I was telling someone, they're like, well, just get it scanned, like scan the poster and then just fix all the tape marks. And I was like, but then it's not the real poster. And in that moment, I was like, oh shit, I'm going to frame this. And so it, it just reminds me that it's more meaningful for me to have the real thing tattered, dented, there's still scotch or whatever masking tape on it from 1999 sitting there on the wall than it is to have the thing that could have been photoshopped, could have been perfect, wouldn't have the rip marks. Did you, have you ever, it makes me sound like I'm intelligent, but no, I'm not, but I know someone that is. Um, have you ever gone through the definition of sincere? The definition of what? Sincere. I, no, I don't even know that so word, I don't think. You will do when I give it your modern day uh, version of it, sincere. Ah, okay. Okay. Comes from the word sincere, which was the word, and I think it was a Greek or, or um, I think it was Greek when they used to make the pots. Okay. And when they had cracks in them because the heat had caused them to crack, they used to fill them with like gold and oh rock. yeah, it's like this you old know, Chinese. It's like this yeah. old Chinese thing to to take the broken pieces and rather than try to perfect it, to fill it with gold and fully embrace. They the, would the embrace crack. the imperfection. So yeah. they would want they. You would not want a pot that was. Per, you would want it with a filling, and you would want it as sincere. So when someone's being sincere, yeah, it means you know with all the experience of the flaws that I've had that I can now speak to you sincerely with experience and knowledge of that. Yeah. But that takes, but that takes courage. Like it takes courage. It takes conviction. Um, it takes, I mean, nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody wants to not be liked. It's one thing to say, listen, like me, don't like to a me. Point. I don't care. To a, no, no. To a, that's when you're trying to do a catch all. Okay. You know, you've got to understand first of all that the plan, let's go, let's get fundamental. And I know we ain't got long, but yeah. let's get fundamental. There are billions of people in the planet. Yes. If you can get 1% of those people to like you, you're buying an island. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. They say so, you only need a thousand, a thousand customers or fans in your life well, to be thing. very well off. I live here and I'm very happy. Okay. At my peak, my peak, I had 93 clients, less than a hundred. 93 yeah. clients. I averaged around 60, but considering the fact that two thirds of those were always billionaires, <laughs> I didn't have to worry. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't go for the masses. I always went for the quality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to focus on today. All the time you're going, well, I can't be this because someone may think of this. You're doing the disservice of showing up as you show up as you as loud and as proud as possible. And let those that resonate, come to you. Yeah. That's what you got to do. When I got rid of bad clients that had a lot of money, I suddenly found I had more room for good clients mm. and the return on effort was lower. My energy was, was being rewarded. When you're having a conversation with someone and it's a great conversation, you're not exerting energy. You're getting fueled by it. You come out of the conversation and you're like, yeah, what are we going to do? You're pumped. You don't dissipate that energy. You get more of it. Yeah. But when you're actually using your energy up going, yeah, 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 no, I, no, I see where you're coming from. But we should, no, 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 you're right. You're right. I get, you're tired and exhausted. And you need to go and lay down after that call. So focus on where your energy is spent. Because if it's spent in the right directions, the return on that is trifold every single time. I love it. Now, I, I, I do have a few more questions. And so... With the success you had, I mean, throughout, but the success you had early on, the cool things that you've done, do you ever have these moments where you look back and feel like an aging rock star or like the good times are behind you? And, and, and how not? Because at your age, so many people give up. 
They give up because they don't want to risk things. They give up because they feel too tired or they think they can't do it again. And like, they just, I've seen people just give up. And, yeah. and so why not you? And why do you, how can you not look at these amazing stories from the past and go like, Oh, I did some cool shit, but you know, that was decades no, ago I, or whatever. I, I heard a statement many years ago and I'll give credit. It came from Joe Polish again. Um, he said to me, the definition of hell is to meet the man or woman you could have been. Mm. And you become good by failing. You know, you fail, that creates experience. Experience creates confidence. Confidence creates credibility. So I want to try many, many different things, and I want to fail to gain that experience to become better the next time. Growth. You know, I don't want to – if I suddenly start going, ah, oh, well, that was good, then I become stationary. If I become stationary, I become still, I become stagnant, I smell, and I die. That doesn't appeal to me in any way, shape, or form. So I want to keep going to racetracks, trying to better my track speed. I want to keep going to strange restaurants and trying food that's disgusting because I want to try to find the next thing. I want to grow and experience and develop. It's called life. It's called living. It's not called stationary. That's not what I want to be. So no, I'm not an aging rock star, and I don't look at the things that I've done as great. They're great stories. But I always want to be, you wait until you see what I get up to next. <laughs> oh, I love it so much. I love it so much. Is, is this your energy all the time? How do you, how do you keep it up? Or, or, uh... I surround myself with people with energy. I told you right mm. at the beginning, make sure mm -hmm. you're in the right rooms. If this had been a dull podcast, it would have lasted <laughs> for three minutes. And I'd have been gone and told you that I run out of internet or something. But no, the energy from you, the conversations, our conversation, who it can help, who it can benefit. How can I? I've got another one, as you know, coming up very, very shortly. Yeah. I'm going in there at 200 mile an hour because of this. Steve is a master storyteller, isn't he? I'd love the chance just to spend like an evening with him sometime and hear everything that that man has seen and done. That would be a story. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one. If you don't like where you are in life, change the room you're in because you've got to be in a room filled with people who want more, who think more, and who do more. Number two, become great at failing because failure gives you experience. Experience builds confidence and confidence creates credibility in the eyes of others. So go out there and fail. And number three, don't allow your self-doubt or your limiting beliefs to change you from who you really are. Thinking that you're gonna be more accepted by others just by changing yourself, it only leads to unhappiness and even more self-doubt. So even though it's really hard, always be yourself. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, then you've gotta face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy never easy but remember we we aren't just dreamers we're doers because we do hard things if you need to learn how you can put money to work for you to pay down debt or to get financial freedom you've got to hear how this expert breaks it all down click on the video right over there for that real inspiring conversation